Hi, I'm Ted Morrissey, and this is a video for my long story and novella course. And uh, particularly, we're going to be talking about uh, Ernest Hemingway and this novella, The Old Man and the Sea. Um, there are a couple of things, at least a couple of, of you know, significant things that I want to uh, kind of underscore as lessons, I think, that as writers we can take away from this particular, um, this particular work. And uh, I'm going to be drawing a little bit from this book, Key West Hemingway, A Reassessment, edited by Kirk Kernut and Gail D. Sinclair. And uh, I'll, like I said, I'll be getting back to that in just a few minutes here. So as I perhaps have, have uh, mentioned elsewhere, you know, I uh, of, an, am of an age where I was a huge Hemingway fan when I was younger because, um, you know, I... I was really exposed to a lot of Hemingway in high school and in my undergrad days, and he was really held up as sort of the, the king of, uh, of, of novelists and short story writers. And as someone who was an aspiring novelist and short story writer, I really looked to Hemingway for um, you know, a lot of guidance uh, in terms of how to write. And, and in my earliest days, I, I did try to imitate uh, much of what he was doing on the page, or at least as I understood it at the time. Eventually, I um, you know, kind of moved beyond that, and now uh, Hemingway's style is sort of antithetical to my own sensibilities. Uh, I prefer much more uh, complicated, complex kinds of, of use of language, syntax, vocabulary, those kinds of things. Uh, but there was a time when Hemingway's more straightforward uh, sort of a syntactical approach was uh, what I really aspired to and certainly obviously what he was known for. So some of the early Hemingway stuff that I really, really loved at the time that I, I read it, you know, the, the Sun Also Rises was you know, particularly meaningful to me and, and so on. Um, in retrospect, I'm not nearly as in love with uh, now, but this, this little book, The Old Man of the Sea, um, I don't know, I was probably in my early 30s or thereabouts when I first read it. So I was, so I was a little late. I mean, I didn't, and it didn't, I knew, of course, I knew about it, of course, when I was younger, but for some reason I didn't get around to reading this particular Hemingway until I was a little older. And I really, really liked it. Um, but as time has gone by here, I've discovered that I maybe really, really like it even more. Um, so, uh, so I do want to talk about, about this in particular. And like I said, point out some things I think as writers, we can really, you know, uh, take away from it, uh, or at least consider kind of going forward. Um, the main thing that I had you think about in the discussion posts was this idea of breaking point of view. And uh, uh, some of us were a little bit confused by that question and weren't quite sure what I was talking about, which is fine. Nevertheless, you all managed to respond in meaningful ways, uh, regardless of whether you were looking at the story in quite the way I had in mind. Uh, but, but that's OK. Um, but uh, I want so I do want to talk about point of view. But the main reason that I want to I want to focus on point of view is because Hemingway does some very unusual things in terms of point of view. And uh, point of view is one of those areas that, um, you know, beginning fiction writers in taking, you know, creative writing classes and eventually workshopping classes and so forth, I think um, we, we learn oftentimes as one of the cardinal rules um, is uh, not to break point of view. Once you establish point of view, whether it's a, uh, first person or third person, third person omniscient, third person limited omniscient, whatever it might be, once you establish it, stick with it. And uh, like I said, I think that's one of those uh, do's and don'ts that we, we learn. And I think this story is a good example of, you know, that's not always necessarily a rule that needs to be followed. And, and that's what I want to look at in particular. Um, you know, I, I think it's important to realize that there are rules and regs. Oh, got a dog barking. Hold on one second. Came back. So um, I do think that there are some rules and regs that, that teachers give younger writers 
um, that are good, that are important at the time because they give them something to hang on to and, and give some structure to their writing. I think that maybe the classic example isn't necessarily from creative writing, but it's teaching younger students the five paragraph theme, you know, the, the classic introduction with the thesis statement and the three subtopics, then each of the three body paragraphs looks at each of those subtopics. Then you have a conclusion that essentially sort of restates what you've already said. And we teach that to younger, younger writers and they really absorb it. Um, but the thing is, it's not really the best way to write an essay. It's, it's, it's one way, and it teaches certain fundamental ideas about structure and logic, but really, essays should be much more complex than that. They should match the complexity of the topic you're trying to discuss, the thesis statement you're trying to put forward, and so forth. So as we try to move uh, students from that model to a more complicated, sophisticated model, that can be a real struggle. You know, as you probably know, I taught advanced placement English for most of my career as a high school teacher, but I also taught for a number of years uh, in the first year writing program at uh, University of Illinois Springfield, and I taught similar kinds of courses uh, for Benedictine University, and um, and trying to get those those advanced seniors and then those first year college writing students to unlearn the five paragraph theme and to write in a different sort of way, that was a real struggle because they had they had been rewarded, you know, uh, for that kind of writing for so long, and were so convinced that it was the only way to write an essay. That trying to get them to see that things like you know, not every topic in the world can be or should be, you know, reduced to three subtopics. The thesis statement doesn't always have to be in the first paragraph. In fact, it doesn't have to be stated at all if it's implied. The conclusion should do much more than simply restate what you've already said. Those concepts were really, really hard for a lot of students to, wow. to embrace because they were so, uh, you know, they were so thoroughly, um, you know, taught to use a, a pleasant term, I guess, the, the five paragraph theme, all right? Well, I think a similar kind of thing happens in teaching fiction writing. I think that we give uh, young and, or beginning fiction writers uh, certain kinds of, you know, rules and regs that are very appropriate and, and, and very useful when one is first starting to try to put narratives together. Sorry, gotta pause again. Sorry, home alone, so my wife isn't here to run interference with the dogs. That may happen again once or twice, just be forewarned. So anyway, we give um, beginning creative writing students, beginning fiction writers, some rules and regs that are very useful. Things like once you establish point of view, don't break it. Um, I know I got in a little bit of a of a, of a discussion in, in a in a MFA course in the not too distant you know past about. Um, you know, a couple of students who were kind of putting forward this idea that a short story that in a short story, every detail should be absolutely vital to the story. And if it isn't absolutely vital, it shouldn't be in the short story. What well, sounds good, you know, reasonable, but who decides what's vital and what isn't? Um, to me, that that gets down to a very subjective sort of thing. Um, and, you know, I, I think that trying to follow that dictate because it's so nebulous could be, you know, really difficult. You know, I'll just give you a couple of examples, one personal and one, one not. Um, as I've maybe talked about before, um, when I wrote my novel Crow Song for the Stricken, I deliberately wrote it as a series of stories that were working both as standalone short stories that I could you know, send out to journals and, and hopefully get published. And as it turns out, I got, got them all published some multiple times. And also they were stories that were part of a, a novel. So they had to also kind of work on this macro level and connect with the other stories. And there were reoccurring images and reoccurring characters uh, and so forth. The current project I, I'm working on 
is taking the same idea, but trying to take it a little bit further in that the narrative is trying to be tighter uh, in terms of the, the time span and, and the focus of, of the narrative and so forth. But I'm still doing that thing where I'm writing these individual pieces, which are functioning both as standalone short stories and as part of this greater you know, superstructure of the novel. Well, when I first started working on Crow Song, I was trying to do this, you know, I was producing these stories that included details that, from my perspective, were there strictly for the, the macro level story, that for the standalone short story, they really weren't necessary. And I thought, well, this, this is going to be a problem because, you know, editors who read these are going to be like scratching their heads like, why well, is this in here? It doesn't seem to really make any sense within the context of the story. And so I thought about, well, maybe I should have two versions of each story. I'll have the, the story version that has these bits and pieces that in my mind are just there to connect eventually with the with the overall structure of the novel and then i'll have another version of the story where i basically edit all that stuff out and it's it's you know getting rid of the superfluous details or whatever you want to say but eh, whatever you know i i don't i don't know that that big of a deal i'll give it a try if i have trouble getting them published then maybe i'll think about doing that so i started sending them out just as as is with these you know uh, details that were part of the the overall macro structure which was still kind of very much under construction and lo and behold they were getting picked up and and published by in some cases by some really good journals um and in some cases winning some awards and so forth and so after that happened with a few of the stories obviously just kind of stopped worrying about it and just you know wrote them as uh you know both these micro you know stories and part of the macro structure and just sent them out without worrying about whether details were extraneous or not and enough editors out there apparently didn't, you know, take note of the fact that there were details in the stories that seemed to be only there for this this more macro structure. Again, the the current project, which I've been working on for like four years now, uh, doing the same exact thing in terms of writing these these pieces, which are both intended as standalone short stories, but also connected uh, with this overall novel. Again, uh, in my mind, uh, every one of them contains the details that really have nothing to do and really aren't contributing in a meaningful way at all to the plot of that particular short story, but they're in there to ultimately connect to this larger framework. And so far, so good. I mean, they've been getting picked up and published, again, by some really uh, good places in, in some instances and getting some some accolades along the way. One was nominated for a Pushcart Prize, you know, et cetera. So again, the point here is that I think on the one hand, it sounds like a pretty, pretty good rule that, you know, in a short story, every detail should be vital. If there's a detail that isn't vital to the story, you should cut it out. But how do you know, right? I mean, it almost implies there's some sort of like Geiger counter or something that you can hold up to each sentence and watch the needle to see if it's vi how, how much vitalness does it have, you know? And, and really, it's so subjective that I don't think it's actually in practicality a terrific, a terrific rule. Not to mention the fact that I think there are some details that contribute to the feel of the story, to the ambiance that the story is creating that aren't vital to the plot or to characterization, but yet they still add something to the story that an individual reader might really, really like. And so maybe a reader or an editor would be attracted to it because just the feel of the story that they get from it, even though maybe the plot and the, the characterization aren't necessarily something that they are super into. Who knows? Like I said, it's also subjective. So, so that rule, I think, is a good one. Um, but definitely, you know, a good one to give younger writers, you know, something to think about, but in practicality, especially as we get more sophisticated in our writing, it doesn't really hold a lot of water, quite honestly, the every detail should be absolutely vital thing. And point of view, I think is another one. Um, point of view is, um, you know, staying within, you know, whatever POV we establish certainly can work and, and, and all the times it is good advice, but it shouldn't be adhered to, 
you know, religiously, um, that there are times when we should experiment with breaking point of view. The first time I read uh, The Old Man on the Sea, like I said, I think I was in my early 30s or something, and I noticed the POV breaks. Um, and so, you know, that kind of stuck with me. So when I started teaching this course a few years ago for Lindenwood, you know, one of the reasons I chose this novella was specifically to talk about point of view, because again, I remembered that it was a good example of, of a, of a you know, work that breaks that rule, but yet still uh, is obviously highly effective. But um, the the thing that I read that got me thinking about uh, Crow Song for the Stricken or what ended up being that, that novel with these shifting perspectives and things like that was um, Tolstoy's War and Peace, um, which I read much later in life. Um, Maybe just very quickly, you know, I when I finished my doctorate, in spite of you know having a bachelor's and a master's and a PhD in English studies and having been a you know avid reader my whole life, there are still these big holes in my in my reading experience that I I you know had a hard time believing. How did I get to this point? Because I was like in my mid forties by the time I finished my doctorate without having read you know some of these great works of literature and and, and the Russians were part of that uh, part of that gap. There were all these great Russian authors and, and books that I had never read. So when I you know finished my doctorate for the next couple of years, I was just I was pretty much all about the Russians. And you know, I read Turgenev and I read Chekhov and I read Dostoevsky and I read Gogol and I read Tolstoy. And uh, one of the things of Tolstoy's that I read, which I'd never read before, was War and Peace. And I noticed in scene after scene after scene, and there are a lot of scenes in War and Peace that oftentimes the scene would begin in one character's you know, point of view. And then by the end of the scene, I would realize, wait a second, we're no longer in that character's point of view. We're in some other character's point of view. But yes, yet the shift was done so subtly and so skillfully that I didn't even notice that we were, we were changing perspectives within that scene from character A to character B. And so that got me thinking about how does one do that as a writer? And so when I started writing the Crow Song stories, one of the challenges I was giving myself was to do this shifting, you know, point of view sort of thing, just to just to see how that would work in a, in a story. And, you know, what do you what do you go about doing? And so I really I looked to Tolstoy's War and Peace and the techniques he was using in that novel to see how he did it. And I try, tried to kind of transfer that over. I'm not going to imply that I achieved it in the way Tolstoy did, but I certainly was mindful of it and trying to do it because I had never done that before. And in all of my years of writing, I'd always pretty much been the whatever point of view I establish in a, in a story or a scene. I got to stick with that. I don't want to be wandering all over the place. But as I said, I remembered Hemingway had done it in this story, this novella. And Tolstoy was doing it all over the place in War and Peace. So I thought I'd give it a try. All right. So let's look at a couple of examples um, in, in um, The Old Man of the Sea. You know, because I think, you know, if you read the, the novella and then you think about it later, maybe a few years later or whatever, uh, you recollect, oh, OK, it's about this <clears throat> this old fisherman in Cuba. And um, he's had a, a run of bad luck in terms of not being able to catch any fish. He goes out by himself in his boat. He lands, a, a, you know, or, or, or hooks, I should say, you know, a really big fish, a big marlin. And then most of the book is about his kind of struggle to, to, to reel it in. And then he has to get it back to shore somehow. And to do that, he has to fight a bunch of sharks. Okay. All right. And it's, it's his story. We're focused on him and so forth. And so I think it'd be easy to remember it as a very, you know, narrowly focused, you know, um, limited third person point of view and Santiago's perspective, because most of it is, but not all of it. And um, in fact, when when the novella begins, we already have this more omniscient kind of narrator. Um, you know, we begin with, he was an old man who fished alone in a skiff in the Gulf Stream, and he had gone 84 days now without taking a fish. And so even though it has sort of this narrative, you know, kind of voice sound to it, and it could be sort of omniscient, still we're, we're in a, a knowledge area that Santiago himself would know. So in, in a sense, we're, we could say, well, we're, we're in that kind of narrow band of his perspective. But then 
Just a few sentences later, in the very first paragraph still, we're told, it made the boy sad to see the old man come in each day with his skiff empty. It made the boy sad. So that's a break. That That's a more omniscient kind of narrator because, you know, maybe Santiago could could sense the boy was sad, but we're just out now told he was sad. So now we're in the boy's perspective. And, and, and again, that happens a few times in the, uh, in the story. Um, you know, uh, on the second page of the story, uh, the old man had taught the boy to fish and the boy loved him. Again, we're in that, you know, the boy's POV and his feelings and so forth. But then for the most part, we kind of shift ultimately to Santiago's point of view and so on. Um, I do want to talk about the end of the book where we make that big break in point of view. And that really is what I was um, thinking about when I, when I wrote the discussion question. But we do have an intrusive narrator from time to time. And this is probably my favorite example of that. This is page 107 in this version of, you know, The Old Man See, Obviously, there's lots of editions out there. But this is towards the end of the novella. Um, and I'll, I'll go back maybe a paragraph. He said... Uh, <clears throat> Hemingway writes, he sailed for two hours, resting in the stern and sometimes chewing a bit of meat from the marlin, trying to rest and to be strong when he saw the first of the two sharks. Aye, he said aloud. There is no translation for this word, and perhaps it is just a noise such as a man might make, involuntarily feeling the nail go through his hands and into the wood. Well, I love that. So, so we've been in Santiago's POV, for, you know, pretty exclusively for quite a while, but then just all of a sudden we have this narrative voice, you know, asserting itself to tell us there is no translation for this word, and perhaps it is just a noise such as a man might make involuntarily, feeling the nail go through his hands and into the wood. Obviously, those are not Santiago's thoughts, right? He's not thinking about translation. He's not thinking about, you know, Christ being nailed to the cross. And obviously, as we've been talking about Christian readings of the text, that's another good example of, of, of how Christianity is inserted into the text as well. But uh, but anyway, I love that just little intrusion. But, you know, it's, it's a huge break in, in, in point of view. I mean, again, if you if you did that in, in workshop class, you might be you might be crucified, you know, for, for doing that in a workshop class. But here Hemingway just kind of casually throws that in there, and then we get right back to Santiago's point of view. Galanos, he said aloud, and he had seen the second fin now coming up behind the first, and yada yada yada. So we go right back into Santiago's point of view. Um, so that little you know narrative intrusion just kind of comes and goes, but but I think it's really really a terrific image to have there in the story. And so the, the point of view break that I had uh, in mind uh, when I originally, you know, uh, wrote that discussion question comes, um, whoops, comes at the very end of the story or, you know, after he's made sure, um, we're told as the boy went out the door and down the worn Coral Rock Road, he was crying again. That afternoon, there was a party of tourists at the terrace, and looking down in the water among the empty beer cans and dead barracudas, a woman saw a great long white spine with a huge tail at the end that lifted and swung with the tide, while the east wind blew a heavy, steady sea outside the entrance uh, to the harbor. What's that? she asked a waiter and pointed to the long backbone of the great fish that was now just garbage waiting to go out with the tide. Uh, Tiburon, the waiter, said, a shark. He was meaning to explain what had happened. I didn't know sharks had such handsome, beautiful, beautifully formed tails. I didn't either, her male companion said. So they're, they're clueless. You know, they don't realize they're looking at the skeleton of a marlin, not the skeleton of a shark. And the waiter had tried to explain or intended to explain to them, but, you know, the language barrier just wasn't going to work out. And then we're back to Santiago up the road in a shack. The old man was sleeping again. He was still sleeping on his face, and the boy was sitting by him watching. Sitting by him watching him, the old man was dreaming about the lions. We're back in Santiago's you know, point of view. And so, again, just a few little you know paragraphs, you know, mainly dialogue there, that there's no way Santiago is privy to this conversation or this, this little mini scene. There's no way the boy is privy to it. 
It's just inserted in there by the narrator, the authorial you know, presence in the text or whatever. Again, um, if you did that in a, in a workshop story, you might be eaten alive as if by sharks, right? Um, I, there, when I was younger, uh, there were these stories, this is before the internet, um, and they may, be, they may be apocryphal, I don't know, um, which I guess is why they're apocryphal, that you know people would take kind of uh, little known, obscure Hemingway stories um, and would you know, retype them you know, put their name on them and send them out uh, to magazine editors and the like. And invariably, they would be rejected. And sometimes the editors would include their rationale, their critique, and really you know, write some scathing, you know, uh, critique as to why they rejected, you know, such and such story. Uh, and the idea here wasn't that these people were trying to, you know, plagiarize and get published, but were rather trying to underscore the fact that Hemingway broke rules. Um, maybe they were trying to prove that uh, maybe some of the reasons that Hemingway's stuff was published, not because it was that great, was but because he had established this reputation. So any, you know, any editor that got a story from Ernest Hemingway was going to publish it regardless of its, uh, you know, is a virtue uh, as, a, as, a, as a short story, you know, artistically or whatever. Um, who knows, you know, what, and, and again, um, who knows how much that happened, but um, the, the point being that for a long time, uh, people have noticed that uh, Hemingway's stories did not really fit uh, the idea of, um, you know, artistically well-balanced, beautifully written kind of narrative pieces or whatever, but I think they were. You know, and I think um, the fact that uh, some of you struggled a bit to find the breaks in point of view uh, to respond to the discussion question is testament to the fact that you can break point of view and it doesn't stand out necessarily, you know, like a, like a sore thumb or however you want to say it, that it can uh, be sort of uh, artfully woven into the narrative fabric of a story or a novel or what have you. So, so that's one important lesson, I think, that we can take from, from uh, The Old Man of the Sea and from Hemingway in general, that um, you know, rules in creative writing, especially, are there to be broken. You need to know them. You, know, you need to know what the do's and don'ts are. But you also need to understand that uh, it's okay sometimes to break those rules. In fact, sometimes the best way to achieve a, a more artistically sophisticated or, or you know, what have you a kind of narrative is to deliberately break the rules, right? So if you feel hemmed in, no pun intended, by certain rules that you always have to follow, I think you're really holding yourself back artistically. I think you should be prepared to, to break the rules sometimes to see what that does for your, for your narrative, right? So that's, that's one rule. The other, the other thing I think we can get from Hemingway um, is that, you know, he, he was an interesting character. Um, you know, certainly if we looked at his biography, you know, we could, we could find plenty of fault, you know, morally speaking, ethically speaking, perhaps from time to from time to time in his life, you know, whether it was his infidelity to various wives uh, and so on. Um, but love or, or not his prose, I think we can recognize that even from his earliest days, he was trying to, to learn new techniques. He was trying to expand his horizons artistically, uh, even after his, his uh, fiction you know, had, had won him some fame. He was, you know, trying to move on to nonfiction uh, and uh, like Death in the Afternoon, his nonfiction account of bullfighting, you know, is a, is a great example where he was, you know, really trying something new and different for him, um, not just writing another novel that would probably be successful because now he was Ernest Hemingway and of course his novels are going to be successful. Um, and then even his, his fiction um, he was trying to uh, expand on. Now I want to read a little bit from, um, for you know, like a page and a half or so from this uh, 
um, anthology, Key West, Hemingway, a reassessment. Hold it up again here, and you can see they're edited by a Kurt K Kirk Kernut and Gail D. Sinclair. Uh, this is University Press of Florida. Pretty recent um, copyright. Let me double check that. Um, first printing 2009, this paperback 2016. I picked it up at uh, the uh, Modern Language Association conference in Chicago in 2019, I think. So I, I've only had it a little bit, but I, I read it from cover to cover. I found it really, really interesting. But as the uh, you know title implies, it um, it looks specifically at Hemingway's years living in Key West um, and tries to sort of assess whether they were they produced some of his greatest work or if they were kind of a reflection of his decline as a writer um, and, and so on. Um, and uh, spoiler alert, um, they're all over the map. These different scholars writing about it. Some, some assert that it was kind of a golden time for him and his writing. Uh, and others assert that, you know, it was this horrific time of his life, all these personal, you know, terrible things going on, some of which he was the author of himself, of course, um, and that his skills as a writer were declining and, and all this kind of stuff. So so the jury is out still, but, but again, interesting assessment. But I wanted to read in particular from uh, this particular essay that appears in the volume, and this is by Mark P. Ott, O-T-T, -T, and uh, the title of the, uh, of the essay is uh, the Anita Logs, and to have and have not, uh, the Gulf Stream as transcribed experience. And the Anita Logs refers to the boat Anita, um, which was the first boat that Hemingway went out on to uh, learn to catch marlin. He eventually you know, bought his own boat, the Pilar. Uh, but the Anita was his first experience out on the sea to catch marlin. And of course, his novel, To Have and Have Not, um, but um, again, I'm just going to kind of read to you uh, almost verbatim, I think, the first page and a half here, and then reflect on that just a little bit, what I hope we can take away from it. <clears throat> Upon moving to Key West in 1928, Ernest Hemingway became increasingly enthralled with deep sea fishing and the Gulf Stream. He had fished since he was a small boy, of course. Photos exist of a three-year-old Ernest, cane pole in hand, trying his luck off the dock near Petoskey, Michigan. But while his fishing for trout in his teens and 20s could be seen as a natural extension of this boyhood hobby, Hemingway's interest in saltwater fishing was completely different. More scientific than experiential, more ichthyologist than Huck Finn. The change is evident in his post-death-in-the-afternoon work in a large part thanks to the consecutive marlin seasons that he spent on the Gulf Stream each late April to August from 1932 to 1937. A careful record keeper his whole life, Hemingway scrupulously maintained logs of these trips, the earliest of which served a literary purpose by, by functioning as a raw reference resource as he composed one trip across the first section of to have and have not. More than any other documents, the fishing logs reveal the daily minutia of Hemingway's life in the 1930s. Dense in observed detail, they give convincing evidence of Hemingway's education as an aspiring marine scientist while showing his progression from a novice saltwater fisherman to an acknowledged expert who contributed to several authoritative texts, such as American Big Game Fishing, published 1935, Atlantic Game Fishing, 1937, and Game Fishing of the World, 1949. The logs include many mundane details, such as menus and libations, but they also find Hemingway crafting short, precise, representational descriptions of what he observed on the Gulf Stream. The exact observations in these logs generated the stylistic transformation that occurred in Hemingway's work between the publication of A Farewell to Arms in 1929 and The Old Man and the Sea in 1952 a period in which Hemingway's, Hemingway's strategy for writing transformed from, quote, learning something from the painting of Cezanne that made writing simple, true sentences 
far from enough to make the stories have the dimensions that I was trying to put in them, end quote, to ultimately desiring that his books about the sea contain illustrations by Winslow Homer. The gist of this transformation can be found in the description of the Gulf Stream in The Old Man and the Sea. And there's a long passage here, but I'm not going to read it. It's because you just have finished reading the uh, the novella yourself. But it's the uh, section that begins, The old man knew he was going far out, and he left the smell of land behind and rode out into the clean early morning smell of the ocean. And then the author gives the rest of that passage. It says, Hemingway's precise language identifies the observed world of the stream, directly classifying the marine life. Like Winslow Homer's brushstrokes, each word is representational, establishing order within the natural world equal to the compositional order of the canvas. In The Old Man in the Sea, Santiago is aware of what is beneath the surface of the ocean. He has studied the Gulf Stream, and he understands the organic unity that exists within nature. These observations the result of having spent hundreds of days on the Gulf Stream from 1932 to 1952, seemed to initiate a subtle shift in Hemingway's writing. While his short and represent, well, I'm sorry, while still short and representational, his descriptions of fishing no longer convey the disorder and instability of modernity suggested by Big Two-Hearted River. Instead, his prose implies a quest for the system of integration behind the chaotic surface. It is a quest that began in the 1930s and whose preliminary stages can be traced in one trip across. All right, so uh, I guess a couple of things I want to draw from that. One in particular, the other is more sort of parenthetical. The, the other big lesson besides this, you know, you know experiment with, with breaking point of view is the fact that, uh, again, love him or hate him, Hemingway's whole life, his whole adult life, he was always reaching beyond. He was always trying to do something different artistically, trying a different genre. Uh, but even within fiction, where he had already won all these laurels and, and all kinds of accolades as, as you know, maybe the greatest novelist of his day and so forth, he was still trying to expand his craft. And we can see in The Old Man of the Sea the, the emphasis put on imagery, on symbolism, and, and so on, that simply isn't there in the earlier work. Um, it, it, his earlier work is much more sort of journalistic um, in terms of just trying to describe the things the way they really are in life. Now he's trying to, with The Old Man in the Sea and other pieces from that, that time period, he's trying to not only describe them as they are, but also what they represent. And um, not all of his fiction from, from this time period is, is completely successful, but I think with The Old Man in the Sea, he achieves a kind of perfection in this representational writing, and that's the reason this little novella endures in a way that a lot of his other writing, again, especially from this time period, may not necessarily today. So the lesson to keep expanding, to keep trying, to keep experimenting, um, that, that try to, trying to grow as an artist, you know, is important. Um, I, I, I'm, I can't, con, uh, you know, attribute the line, but I read just recently a, a, about a painter who is still painting every day at age 92, I think, and someone asked him, why are you still painting every day at age 92? And his reply was something like, because I think I'm making progress, All right? So, so I think that's an important lesson, you know, to always keep expanding, always keep trying new horizons, new things uh, as an artist, you know, whether your art is literary or some other kind of art form, right? The other kind of parenthetical thing is just Hemingway's, you know, his actual mechanics, you know, keeping a log and, uh, and then using that to pull from, you know, later, much later in the case of The Old Man in the Sea, you know, for details, for other kinds of inspiration and so forth. So that kind of record keeping, diary keeping, um, I think nowadays, you know, if you're active with like social media, Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or whatever it might be, um, that can actually be a resource for writers. You know, you can go back to earlier posts 
earlier photographs, earlier whatever, and see if there's something there, you know, that can inspire a new short story, a new novel, a new poem, whatever it might be. All right. So this has gone on a little longer than I intended, so I'll stop there. But I'd be interested to know what you think about um, breaking point of view and, and breaking other kinds of cardinal rules that we learn when we're younger writers. Uh, your thoughts about always expanding, always trying new things, always trying to hone your technique and so forth. And also maybe about record keeping, diary keeping, and how that can kind of feed our, our inspiration as well. All right. So thanks for paying attention. I look forward to seeing you down the road.